did we continue with Habdallah. Ideally, um, okay, a number of authorities discuss whether one may use an electric light instead of a flame. Okay, this is for verse Lama for Shifra Simcha Batyet and all Tolem of Claudia Israel. And for a swift yes. victory over our enemies. Yes, Amen. That's a big Amen. Well, a number of authorities discuss whether one may use an electric light instead of a flame. Ephraim Oyser Grozinski itself deliberately used an electric light in order to equate electricity with fire and to demonstrate that operating electricity on Shabbos is a malacha. However, since an electric light is shielded by glass, certain authorities prohibit this practice. It is preferable to use a flame. I mean, we've never seen anyone use, I've never seen anyone use to have dollar with anything but a flame. Okay. The blessing over the spices is not made if one as it has a blocked nose. She didn't know that. Similarly, a blind person is unable to make the blessing over the flame. So it's, you need to use all your senses. I didn't know that, eh? Yeah. I think the main sense you need to use is your common sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I agree, I agree. A blind person to have a flame too close to them is not a great idea. I agree with you. Terrible idea. Common sense. Listen, I'm, I can see 100% and I need to burn my place down there. There's 45 candles. So you can imagine a blind guy. Cut that out of the video. All right, cool. Let's continue. Okay, Arthur's joining so us now. Do you want to just send a new link quickly? It'll be take... Uh, or is it... Or is it, or is it or There's two, no two, point because Gavin has to go at five past, but we... Uh, no point. No point. I'll come back. Sorry. All right. No, it's, it, I thought my... I've got a problem with my geezer. They're coming tomorrow to fix it. No, I even it's ended my cool. lesson a few minutes early, eh? Because I, because I didn't want to keep Gavin waiting too long. So no problem. I'll make up Thank the you. time. I made up the time with Oak last week anyway. So. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Listen, okay. uh, uh, tomorrow and uh, uh, um, Thursday, uh, uh, can you do it ten to ten to four till till five? <laughs> to four. I can't, I'm, I'm going to my mom tomorrow. It's only at three o'clock. Okay, no problem. Uh, no I'll problem. So we'll do it tomorrow at, at 4.15. That's fine. Yeah, fr I must just check on Thursday. Should I need to just check my calendar. Okay, but my... let's, let's get to the show now because we've only got a half an hour. So that's no problem. Um, but, but Kevin, spend your times uh, on, on the group so we know it's cutting so we can work around it. It's sometimes people ask me it like the day before and uh, I try my, yeah. Um, All right, guys, let's do the share. We can do the yeah, kids another time. Uh, yeah, just, I think, Kev, tomorrow let's do it at 4.15. Uh, you all have seen your mom. Is that okay with you? Yeah, you know, Thursday is good for me. Thursday is good for me at 10 to 4, because I'm going to my mom tomorrow. That's cool. Okay, good, good. All right. Tomorrow will be quite a possible. Fine. All right, let's get started. In um, in review, uh, one issue came up here was this discussion in the Gomorrah that Rav Khir Bar Abba brought uh, with regards to Sumchus, because the rabbis say the burden of proof lies with the damaged party uh, and if he doesn't have proof, he cannot collect any money. Um, and Sumchus is saying, look, there are cases where both parties are in doubt somewhat as to exactly what transpired. And when there's a case of inherent doubt, the right thing to do is to come to some sort of consensus where both the parties meet in the middle. And the classic case was brought uh, very simply that in Baba Kama in 46b, there was a Brisa which discussed if an ox gored a cow and a dead fetus was found at his side. So at that point, it's not known whether the cow aborted the fetus spontaneously. In other words, maybe before being gored, it, uh, it was heavily pregnant, etc. Obviously, then the owner of the damaging ox is not liable for the fetus. But it could just as well have been that it was aborted as a result of body shock, meaning the mother was gored and then she extricated the fetus at which the fetus was also lying dead next to the dead mother. So since we're not 100% sure if the death was caused by the goring ox or not of the fetus, the mother for sure, but if the fetus was born before and just died of exposure 
or was part of the fact that it died through the body trauma, we say, according to says that what they do is that it's clear as far as the uh, mother cow is concerned that the damaged party pays. There's no doubt as far as that's concerned, even with Simchus, as far as I've seen. The doubt was with the fetus. And since the fetus is in doubt, that part you split, but not with the mother. Okay. Can I ask you just one thing, David? Sorry. Is yeah, there sure. any indication of what the value of the fetus would be? Because uh, I, would, I would have thought it would be worth nothing if it's well, aborted. Well, the reality, the reality is that fetus, uh, the reason why we have to take it into account is because although you can't work at what the fetus would have fetched as a full-grown ox or, or, or cow, the reality is that fetus is still worth a certain amount of money. Um, and whatever that money is, there should be liability paid. I mean, even if it's 10 zoos or 20 zoos, it goes towards uh, compensation, especially if the goring ox is a tum and, the, and you only get half for the mother by the damaging animal's body. Listen, those extra 10 zoos count. Whatever it is, it's right. better not getting it. And even if you're getting five out of the 10, it still comes, you know? So whatever it is, there still has to be fairness. So it's about moral principle more than just amount. Um, but the bottom line is it doesn't seem that Sunchus has any doubt in terms of the fact that the damage it pays for the mother, because that's clearly a case of goring. We just don't know if it's fetal shock, etc. cetera. Um, so Sorry, this is, it, this is what they, 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 the, the, dam the damaged party is claiming for the loss of the fetus. Is that what they also no, claim? No, no. So I'm saying they got to the accident site and they can see a dead fetus and a dead gourd cow. But nobody witnessed if she gave birth to the fetus before she got birth, uh, before she got gored, and therefore wasn't able to provide the fetus with any sort of care or milk or whatever. In which case, that's not direct damage; that's indirect damage. Or in fact, if the goring itself caused the uh, fetus to come out early, and it was the body shock that the mother went through to cause the fetus to have been stillborn, specifically because of the goring. So if the goring caused this dead fetus, no doubt the damager has to pay. But if, uh, if it died for sure as a result of uh, normal, what do you call it, exposure by a stillbirth, et cetera, that had nothing to do with the goring animal, it's not the damager's fault. The truth of it is we don't know here. That's exactly the point. We don't know. They got to the scene where they've got no form of timeline. And therefore, Sumkus is saying in 46b that they should come to a split fee with regards to the fetus. The mother, you can see, has been gored, so the damager pays for that in full. Very straightforward. So this is a case of perhaps and perhaps, meaning neither the damager nor the damage knows exactly what transpired here. Then it brings in this Gomorrah, well, what do we do here? Because this is a case of certainly and certainly. What are we talking about here, certainly and certainly? What we're saying is here, each party, the damaged and the damaged, is sure that they're right. And we're saying, well, how's this analogous to Sumchus' case? In other words, do we hold like the rabbi, where the burden of proof is on the damaged party? Or do we hold by Sumchus and say a case of certainly and certainly is the same as perhaps and perhaps. Why is it certainly, as I said, Kevin, both the, both the plaintiff and the defendant are adamant about their point of view. Whether they're lying through their teeth or they believe they saw what they saw. As an example, yesterday we said, you go watch a sports match and one person loves Man United and one loves Liverpool. And each one is sure that they saw that the team went through injustice because they were viewing from different sides of the stadium and also they emotionally attached to the outcome. So uh, that's why we have camera footage because it's not always so clear. And the judge isn't to know. So even if they certain, we say this is a case of perhaps, perhaps, why? Because how would the judge know unless information is furnished? So therefore this could be according to Sumchus's opinion at which case the rabbis don't agree. The rabbis turn around and say, well, if it's a case of perhaps and perhaps, then the onus is on the damaged party to prove his case, to extract money from his fellow. It's not like you split it down the middle. So I can see it from Sumchus's point of view, 
Um, why? Uh, to a certain extent, because if I was the um, if I was the damaged party, and and I didn't have the right evidence necessarily, because you know sometimes circumstances are not ideal. I mean, nobody's waiting there with a camera when there's a car accident. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you don't have the evidence. So the damaged party feels at least he's getting something. And the damager also doesn't want to be held before the court and say on trumped up charges and say, well, let's just split the difference down the middle. So you can understand the rabbi's point of view as well. So the point of it is, is that does this particular Gomorrah fall, fall in the case of uh, uh, Sun defined case since it's certainly and certainly and we say yes why because the judge doesn't know they might be adamant they could be lying or they could be misinformed or they could believe what they think they saw so because it's a case of what you call inherent doubt we say that some courses case in this case could apply have i got you so far guys do you make that is it making sense to you so far yeah i'm fine Cool. So since this is a since this is the particular case, we're saying, hang on. A question is raised regarding Sumchus's view. Rav Abar Bar Mamal said to Rav Chia Bar Abba, did Sumchus say his ruling even when the litigants claim certainly and certainly? So this is what we just explained. Rav Chia Bar Abba said to Rav Abba Bar Mamal, yes, Sumchus said his ruling even in the litigants claim certainly and certainly. So the Gemara asks, and on what basis does Rav Chia Bar Abba conclude that our Mishnah refers to a case in which the litigants claim certainly and certainly? When it says certainly and certainly, the defendant says certainly, the damaged party uh, uh, says certainly, that's the plaintiff, and the defendant, which the, um, is the uh, owner of the attacking ox, says certainly. So perhaps the Mishnah speaks of cases in which the litigants put forward their claim as possibilities rather than certainties. So what it's saying is that, you know, just because they sound convincing doesn't mean they're right. And then the Gemara says, but hang on a second. We've got to go on their tone of voice. What does their tone of voice say? It says that this one says your ox did the damage. And this one says not so. The response not so connotes that the defendant is certain and the damage was not done by his ox. So the response to this is that, um, again, that even though that they say it with absolute, what do you call it, um, enthusiasm conviction. and conviction, exactly, it's not indicative of the fact that they themselves are necessarily certain. They just don't want to lose money. Okay, so it says that is perhaps our Mishnah refers to a case in which even the litigants admit that they do not know whether the plaintiff's ox was injured on a rock or by the defendant's ox. Accordingly, we can only prove from our Mishnah that Sumchus and the rabbis disagree in a case of uncertain claims. However, in cases where the litigants claim to be certain of their positions, perhaps Sumchus agrees that they do not divide the claim. On what basis did Rav Chia Bar Abba assume that our Mishnah speaks of a case in which they make claims of certainty and thereby demonstrate that Sumchus disagrees even in such a case? So then it says that um, at the end of the day, the judge is in show of certainty. They can say what they want. It's not clear. It's not 100% clear. So therefore, th that argument still stands of um as far as that's concerned now um so we say we cannot take tone of voice to indicate anything now rough papa objected to this whole thing right uh because the gomorrah challenges the interpretations that the mission is discussing a case in which the litigants say certainly and certainly so what rough papa objected to is as follows he said hang on if this is true then since the first part of the Mishnah is discussing a case of certainly and certainly, the latter part of the Mishnah must also be discussing a case of certainly and certainly. All right, guys, what's the first part of the Mishnah? Do you remember? Uh, first, of two. Um, first part of the Mishnah. Or the All right, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's easy. Uh, Gavin's ox was running away from my ox. 
Gavin claims to the judge that my ox was responsible for damaging his ox. I turn around and say, well, your ox did run away from my ox, but it's Grom, it's indirect. My ox didn't directly injure your ox. It injured itself in panic, running away from my ox. And since we hold that Gromer indirect damage doesn't count by many rabbinic opinions, um, at the end of the day, I don't have to pay Gavin. And Gavin says, it's not true that my ox uh, was damaged on a rock. Your ox smacked into my ox. So Kevin brought up an excellent point yesterday. I said, come on. You can see when a horn pierces somebody compared to when somebody smashes themselves against a flat rock. You can look for the injury. And I thought Kevin's point was brilliant. The reality is that the things that are, are taught us of Kerry, what is that? If my ox kicks your ox, if my ox bodily damages your ox, it doesn't have to be a piercing horn. And in that case, uh, when your ox runs against a rock or my ox runs against you, the damage is one of what you call shallow impact or compact um, uh, stress on the physiology of the body, meaning it's not necessarily piercing through muscle and tissue. It's a breakage. And breakage happens on flat impact. Does that make sense, Gavin? So there's no way to deduce what caused it. So Rav Papa is saying, hang on. The first part of the mission is talking about an ox chasing an ox. The damage is claiming that the ox injured itself on a rock and the damaged party said your ox uh, damaged my ox. It didn't, it's not true, it injured on a rock. So that is a case of certainly and certainly. That meaning that at least they're both certain of their positions. Why? Because even if the damage is lying that said your, your, your ox uh, hit upon a rock, if there are no witnesses, how can the damaged party prove it? So they're both certain. So that's certainly and certainly. And Rav Papa said, okay, so you can't talk about a divergent case. If you want to bring this case with Simchus into play, that this is part of the discussion, you can't have certainly and certainly and then certainly and perhaps. In other words, it's got to be consistent. You can either say that the Mishnah uh, could be in a line with the Brisa from Sumchus, or it can't. You can't have different parts. Uh, that's his objection. Because he's saying the latter part of the Mishnah must also be discussing a case of certainty and certainty. And what's the latter part of the Mishnah? If one of the damage in oxen was large and one was small, and the damage party says the large ox did the damage, while the damager says not so, rather the small ox did the damage. Or if one of the damaging oxen was Tum and one was Muad, and the damage party said the Muad did the damage, while the damager says not so, rather the Tum did the damage. In both of these cases, the burden of proof rests on the one who seeks to exact money from his fellow. This implies that if the damaged party doesn't bring proof, he takes as much as the damager says. So what Rav Papa is saying is he says, listen, he doesn't hold, it seems, from this rule of Sumchus, that they split the money. Meaning that this isn't a case of what you call, Kevin, um, what, what do you call it, inherent doubt. He's saying in both cases, the, lit, uh, the plaintiff and the defendant, the damager and the damaged, are absolutely sure of their possessions. The plaintiff in this case is the damaged, suing the damager who is the defendant. And both of them are adamant. Uh, so what it's saying is that the, the damaged party is saying, no, it was your muad that attacked my ox and you must pay more. You must pay full payment because your muad has damaged before. So it's probably, you know, he's thinking is probably likely whether he's lying or not. He comes across as adamant, according to Rav Papa, and uh, the other one says, no, it was a tum. And the same thing, uh, your animal attacked mine in the case of two tum animals. And the damager says it was uh, oh. a small animal that attacked my large. And the damaged party said, no, it, it's not the case. It's actually, um, uh, what do you call it? It's, it's actually your large animal that attacked my large animal. So this is a case where they're both certain. So it's different to inherent doubt where they both rock up at the site and they can see what's going on. 
with a, a fetus next to the cow that's dead, but nobody was there on time, so they cannot be certain. So he's saying the two cases are not analogous. And since the two cases are not analogous, we go back to the default position of the rabbis, which state that the job of the damaged party is to bring proof uh, as to what happened. Otherwise, he cannot extract money from, the, uh, from his fellow. And what happens is he is basically, now this is the interesting part, is this is the weird part. If um, this implies that if the damaged party does not bring proof, he takes as much as the damager says. Okay. If he doesn't bring proof, he takes as much as the damager says. So what does the damager say? He says either that uh, my ox that attacked your ox was Tom or the small ox. So the damaged party has to accept what the damager says unless he can bring proof to the contrary. Does that make sense? That's what Republicans say. Well, the damage is honest, but in this case, he's, he's probably not. Listen, when are people ever honest, Gavin, when it costs them money? 90% of people. We all believe in Hashem. I don't understand how these people do this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Listen, I, I, agree, with, I agree with you. But a you know. Jew, I fully understand. Or any, any, any secular person, but if you believe in God, this should never happen. But obviously, it does. Otherwise, Hashem wouldn't put this well, together. That, uh, that's exactly it. You should never have a case of a murder, of theft, of adultery, of anything. Listen, um, the, the one thing that you've got to say, Gavin, is perhaps that neither of them are totally sure. I'll, can I give you an example? Say the damager is not sure, right? But he sure as heck knows that the damaged party wants to take as much from him as possible. So in that situation, he's going to count an argument. Because he's not sure. So why must he pay more either? Yeah. Okay, that's true. You see, it's, it's going to happen in a lot of the cases where they, you know, where firstly there's either no witnesses, there's, the damage is just there, you know, and there's a bigger and a smaller. Obviously, the guys, the one guy's going to take the one side and the other one the other side. And that's probably self preservation because the damager doesn't want to lose everything if he, if, 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 it, if there's a decent possibility that a small animal attacked the big one. But that's also highly unlikely, yeah. But anyway, that's just the... Listen, I, I can the, understand a case where a person says your muad animal attacked my animal because yes. if it's got a habitual nature of attacking, it is more pro it is higher probability that the muad attacked your ox than a tum because it's got a nature of many times warned as having that behavior. So that I can understand more. As far as the larger animal attacking my larger animal, that I think is hearsay. Because the probability could be about the same. It could be the same. And I'll prove it's it. highly unlikely that a small, a small, small one will attack a big one. Do you know, you know how a dog, we had a dog called Dinky. It was a Yorkshire Terrier, a tiny thing, a battery operated creature. You know, it looks <laughs> like it's got batteries in it, and it used to yeah. You know how it died? Do you want to know how it died? It attacked the right father next door. Oh, yeah. It came off second best. It came off. No, so you're right. So you're right. Okay. Good point. Thank okay. You. Look at me. Look at me. You've seen me having an argument with somebody twice my size because I've got the brain of a chihuahua. Now, Damon, did you, did, 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 did you have a claim against that Rottweiler's owners because that Rottweiler was more or was it Tom? The Rottweiler choked to death on Dinky. Did it? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That part I'm kidding so about. Like, that would have been worthwhile, though. <laughs> was it a time? Was it a word? Right while or a time one? <laughs> so all, 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 all I'm saying to you is that animals often don't understand right. perception of size limitations, even stupid right. humans like myself. So the thing yeah, even, that, uh, Gucci, Gucci and uh, uh, Enrico, my two dogs. Yeah. The ones that, the ones that, uh, what's it, a little poodle, and, and he takes on this uh, uh, massive dog. It's crazy, yeah. Crazy, exactly. That's a perfect it's, example. It's the same size. Exactly. That's, that's 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 exactly it. So the reality is, it's very possible. So the thing of it is, if you come to me and you damaged me and said, "Look, I don't know, I don't know what's happened here. I don't know if your muad attacked my ox or my tum, and I don't want to lose money, but I don't want you to lose money. Can we split the difference?" I say, "Yeah, okay." So if you're reasonable, I'm reasonable. If you come and say, 
yeah, you owe me maximum money. It was your muad. It's an habitual gora, just, or it was your lot. I'm going to think to myself, he might be right, but Jesus, unless I got, unless I'm sure, why well, must I pay the bigger amount? So I'm going to say, well, how do you know? Come prove it. I think it's a smaller one, actually. Prove it. And then if we have to prove it according to Rav Papa, then unless you can prove it, you get the lesser amount. It's your job to prove it. Okay, but I'm going to end off on one note. And what's this particular point is that there is a question that comes up is to say, why should the damage party get anything at all if he doesn't have evidence? Yeah, is that, I was actually going to say that on this example that you just gave me, in that particular case, the guy could just turn around and, and he doesn't have to even say that it's big or it's small or whatever. You know, the other guy doesn't have evidence, there's, there's no case. Exactly. So the case, the thing of it is, Ralph Papa is very reasonable, and he's turning around and said, "Look, if you cannot prove that the damage the damager owes uh, that the owner of the damage uh, damaging ox owes you the greater sum, and he's prepared to admit to the smaller sum, and you can't bring evidence, be happy you got that. Take yeah, better it. Than better than nothing. Better than nothing. Yeah. But there's a case which we're going to learn tomorrow." Uh, from Rabbi Barna's son that says, actually, it's not the case, is that you're not entitled to anything at all. Somebody can come to you and say, well, you damaged me. And uh, and at the end of the day, unless I can bring evidence, they don't have any case. That's how normal law works. You need evidence. So uh, uh, so that case with Rabbi Barna's is even stricter. But in, in a reasonable case, you can understand that there's a conflict between the two. What's the conflict? Is that if I'm a reasonable person that uh, my animal damaged yours, and I have a slight hint of guilt, and there might have been one or two witnesses, and I can see that my ox scored yours, and people are Jewish, and they're going to deal ethically with each other, they might not be happy to pay the maximum, but they can certainly say, look, I can see there's damage. Unless you can prove that it was the maximum, I'll pay you the minimum. But I'll still pay you. So they'll come to some sort of an arrangement. But if you start to get funny and saying, you owe me the max, so I'll sue you. I'll say, you know what? Prove your whole case. Good luck. So you can understand how these things can escalate in two seconds. So I think we can end off before tomorrow. I don't want to discuss uh, um, the refutation of Rabbi Bar Nassan yet. I'm just going to hint to it that Rabbi Bar uh, Rabbi Barna son is turning around and saying, unless you got evidence, you ain't claiming anything. You're not going to get anything whatsoever. But that's the same as what the rabbis say. Uh, no, the rabbis are not saying that necessarily. From what I understand, the rabbis are saying that the bird, uh, that they, they're saying that in the absence of the burden of proof, you don't split the difference. You take the minimum that the damaging party, the damage is prepared to admit to. Uh, so that so, so the rabbi is more in line with Rav Papa, it looks like. Well, in the case of the ox, um, let's just take a look at the, uh, that particular Bryce. Okay? I can't necessarily speak for this, uh, necessarily 100%, but I can say to you, if you have a look at the quintessential case with the... Uh, basically uh, the cow and the dead fetus, right? In that mm -hmm. particular case, um, the cow is not in dispute. What's in dispute? How the fetus died. Was it a result of the goring or not in 46B? So in that point of dispute, the rabbis say you have to prove it or you get nothing. But they don't have to prove it in the case of a cow because it's got a half a horn sticking in it. In other words, they see the impact Etc. But nobody might have witnessed it. But in the case of the fetus, we don't know how to die. That's an inherent uncertainty. Does that make sense? In that case, then uh, he can't extract any money. But it would seem at least Ralph Papa says that you uh, you can collect what the damager uh, admitted to. That you can do. If the damager admitted to the minimum, you can at least collect on that because there's consensus. So what we're going to find is Gavin's got a good point. It depends. It depends. And I'm just going to leave off on this note, how the, da how the damaged party has dealt with the damager. So if the damager 
uh, is, a, is accused by the damaged party. Uh, and he said, your muad killed my ox or your uh, large ox killed my uh, large ox. Unless he's got evidence, he can actually come away with nothing. Because he's actually, by trying to grab more, he's let go of the claim for less. That's the principle of Rabba by Nasser. That if you're so certain, you've already given up on the less amount because you're convinced you deserved it. If you say, I think this is the case, and I think it was the bigger party, you haven't let go necessarily of a compromise of the lower claim. And therefore, you would get the lower amount which the damage admitted to. But if you adamant and say, I don't accept that as payment, I want the max, you can come away with nothing. Let me give you a primary example of some idiot. You know this please call me with the Vodacom? Yes, He's been in court for 20 years because the idiot doesn't want to accept 48 million rand, okay? Yeah. What he doesn't understand, he thinks he's entitled to 10 billion rand. What he doesn't understand is he gave them an idea, but they had the infrastructure, the billions, to make money off that idea. He couldn't have done that idea. He couldn't have started a network. He couldn't have run a cell phone company. He gave them an idea, and they said to him, 48 million rand they'll give him for the idea. But without Vodacom, he wouldn't have been able to do anything with the idea. He's not entitled to how he's done the cheshbon, that on every please call me, he's entitled to a share of the profits. His greed has cost him 20 years of his life. And I hope he comes away with nothing except oh, the 48 million. He's entitled to the 48 million, but he lost. But his attorney fees have cost him more than 20 million. He's also done the cheek to do crowdfunding, to take money from innocent people that thought there was some uh, person that had been misaligned by a big corporate David and Goliath case, and he was this unfortunate guy, when in fact, the public have been trying to pay for his court fees, and he's lost maybe 20 million rand in court fees, and come away with 20, instead of having two decades ago, come away with maybe 30 million rand at that point, or even 20, which he couldn't have spent 20 million rand in a lifetime, and come out easy. Absolutely. Let me tell you something. If you work for a company and you invent something, it belongs to that company. It's, it's their intellectual property. You cannot actually, you don't own it, then you have no right to it. This guy is an absolute yeah. con artist, man. This is rubbish. You're it's not rubbish. To get a set. It's not even an intelli it's, it's not even more than a five second idea, actually. Uh, the only thing of it is, Gavin, is that he wouldn't have been even able to implement it because he had no money. He was an employee. Absolutely. How does he. I would have taken. The first offer that they offered me, if it was like above like five bar, I would have been just thrilled. Man. Absolutely. And I think the first offer was was like about 10 bar or something like that, I think. Exactly. So what we're learning from this Gomorrah, if you come out with nothing else, what you need to come out with the fact that Rabbi Barnasan is saying, if you're reasonable and saying, perhaps, I'm not sure, but I think you owe me this, but I'm not letting go of my lesser claim. I'm happy. Let's see what we can, you'll come away with something. If you're adamant, by grabbing onto this, you're letting go of that. It's like somebody that's got uh, a nice girl at home, Hamish girl, but he thinks of all the girls he could have had. He forgot in high school he couldn't get a date. Now he, he, he's looking at this hot chick and thinks he should. And you know what? If he ends up messing around with her, he'll lose his wife because he's, he's by laying claim to this girl, he will let go of his claim to his spouse. And this is what we're talking about, lust and greed. Yeah. which is the undoing of mankind. It says three things will remove a man from the world. Honor, greed, and lust, I think it is. Isn't that right, Kevin? And all three of those things are exactly what the Democratic Party in America stands for. I agree. Yeah. But, totally. but let, uh, this, this year, I want you to come away with that. With that. Now, Rav Papa is saying if you're reasonable, even if you say certainly and certainly, if you're reasonable, you still have to have proof. But if you don't have proof, then you can still go on what the owner of the attacking ox said. And he said, listen, it's a tum ox or small ox. And that would suffice. In other words, if you don't have enough evidence, be grateful that he's prepared to admit to at least some of the damage. Proof, right, proof guys, beyond the full doubt. For the exactly, full proof for beyond that. reasonable doubt. Guys, I hope this share helped you. Thanks for starting. Oh, no, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks, everybody. Arthur, as well. I also want to